I see that there are a lot of people who are joining us now. Good. Got an answer, so I know that somebody is listening to me. Okay, good. Uh, I don't know if this is your first time using Click Meeting. It's the first time for me. But uh, I found out that there are several uh, things that you can use here to uh, to ask me if there's any sort of uh, technical issue. There are buttons you can click there. But good. Uh, let me know. I'm, I will try to look at the chat as much as as I can. Although I know that it will be difficult as the presentation goes. Okay. I also apologize in advance if you hear a baby crying in the background. It's my baby son, okay? Uh, hi from Guaida. Uh, so uh, if something, if you hear a baby crying, rest assured he's okay, he's with his mom. Uh, hello, BH, all right. And Americana too, all right. Countryside, some follow. All right, from Pará, all right, good. Uh, today we're gonna be talking a little bit about uh, adolescence. Um, and we are going to talk about how this is uh, a concept that uh, seems very straightforward, especially in English, since we are talking about uh, teenagers. So uh, if you look at the WHO website, for example, uh, people from all over Brazil, all right. Uh, if you look at the WHO website, you see that uh, they define teenagers uh, as people who go from 10 to 19. Uh, and of course, this is where teenager comes from. Uh, but today we're going to discuss a little bit about uh, the other things that make a teenager, the things that make an adolescent uh, what they are. Uh, and to, so um, just some ground rules uh, in terms of organization here. I will be talking on stop. Uh, I'm talkative. So you can uh, ask questions via the chat here. Uh, they will appear here and I will address them uh whenever uh there's a pause or by the end of the session of the the webinar uh i'll try to address any questions that you might have had so to start with uh i think that uh, it's pretty much uh a consensus that uh, adolescence is a transition phase when we're talking about a teenager we're talking about people who are going from childhood into adulthood uh in we cannot ignore the fact that the, the, the aspect of change is paramount here. So teenagers are going through a lot, but you would be somewhat um, uh, inaccurate, really, to say that teenagers are just a transitional phase. Teenagers have a very specific culture. Uh, and they have a very clear uh, ethos, if I might say so. Uh, and the changes that they're going to, they're going through, even though they will inform a lot of what is happening there, they are not uh, the only thing that we can count on to help us define what a teenager really is. Yeah. In terms of physical changes, for example, teenagers are going through uh, a lot of hormonal changes that will change, uh, especially in boys, for, uh, they will change their tone of voice, for example, uh, we're talking about uh, hair growing in places where I didn't used to. Uh, and we are talking about uh, growth in, when we're talking about height, for example. And this is the moment in which uh, we start seeing those people uh, the way we're going to see them throughout adulthood. So by age 15, for example, uh, a lot of girls already look a lot like they're going to look like uh, when they're 30, for example. Boys might take a little bit longer, but it's, uh, I, I have, for example, a couple of teenage uh, cousins, and they're adults, basically, in terms of their bodies, right? They are uh, taller than me, they, their voice is already very deep, so uh, we can notice those physical changes very easily, right? And it's usually what draws our attention the most. Uh, I don't know if you have already been through this kind of situation, but... Uh, it seems to me that kids nowadays, they, they're growing a lot more than they used to, right? Uh, I remember being 15, having a lot of friends who were a lot shorter than me. Uh, and now every 15 year old I see is what, six feet tall. So uh, I, I don't know what's going on there, but the physical changes are the, the ones we notice the most. Uh, beard growing for boys, 
uh, all of these things are very noticeable, right? And the psychological changes are very uh, important as well because, um, especially when you when you're talking about a, a teenager inside your house, but you can see that with uh, students as well. Uh, sometimes they are really cute and they are really uh, peaceful as kids, and they will do everything. Uh, you want them to do in terms of classwork, for example, and then you start noticing the rebellious signs uh, appearing. The, uh, they start uh, interacting a lot more uh, with people of, uh, from the opposite sex, for example. So it's uh, it's very clear the the difference that we can see in terms of psychology as well. Although some people don't really seem to go through that phase, uh, at least externally, it doesn't seem as if they are very different than they were when they were kids. But uh, for some teens, it's very, very clear. Uh, you can see one uh, a year after you saw this person for the last time, and they are completely different. They look different, but they, more importantly, they act different. Uh, and the interests change very much as well. Uh, when we're talking about the development in the brain, uh, this is one of the things that we cannot see, but it's uh, something that, uh, has become um, one of the things that has been discussed the most recently, uh, the changes there are, that their brains are going through. The reason this is becoming, uh, I would say, the, the hottest topic in terms of uh, teenage development nowadays is uh, the brain is still the organ that we really do not understand. So uh, we have been having, uh, more studies regarding the brain in the the way that the brain develops during the the teenage years is very important to to tell us what to expect from a healthy brain in adulthood right so the changes that are going uh the, the, the under the hood so to speak right uh teenagers are uh the, the two main things that are changing there uh are the frontal lobes and the, what, what's the, the, the part that deals with the, the pleasure of the brain. So this uh, researcher, Frances Jensen, uh, she's talking about, she talks about how the frontal lobes are not fully there yet. So basically for teenagers, uh, the, the development in the brain, and I, I'm, I'm going to do this very uh, simply because I, I'm not an expert in the brain, uh, but, uh, I just wanted to share some of the uh, some of the research that has been uh, conducted in that area. Uh, what happens is uh, there's the, the insulation here in the brain starts from the back and goes to the front. So when teenagers are um, 13, 14, the, the frontal lobes are not fully developed. And uh, these frontal lobes, might the, um, the connections between them are not fully developed. And this will not happen uh, on average, until they are in their early teens, in their early 20s. So uh, when you're talking about uh, with a 21-year-old, 22-year-old, uh, this part of the brain is not really um, working properly. And this is the part of the brain that deals, that deals with uh, three very important things, planning, self-awareness, and judgment. So uh, this is the part of the brain that allows us as adults to think ahead about the consequences of our actions and to weigh the, the, the cost and the benefit of those actions. So uh, yeah, teenagers can be very troublesome. Uh, and this is, might be one of the reasons why. Uh, so it's not really their fault in, because of their chemistry, right? So what, what happens is uh, they know that they are able to, to they have abstract uh, thought. So uh, by the time they are 13, uh, abstract thought is already well developed. They are capable of uh, reasoning, they have good logic. If you have already discussed with a well-informed teenager, you will know that they know all the, the rhetorical tricks, right? Uh, try talking about politics with a teenager, right? Uh, if they are, uh, they have a lot more free time than we do, right? So they are able to, to come up with a lot more data than we might have. Uh, but even though they are capable of very complex thought, not fully capable of uh, understanding the, the far-reaching consequences of their actions. So um, I don't know if you will remember this, uh, but there was a, 
it was a movie and it was also in Malhação. But uh, the, some kids who were trying to, uh, they went into a, uh, one of those water reservoirs and they, they went uh, diving there. Uh, and uh, the height was such that one of them uh, hurt his back and it, it, he might have got uh, fully paralyzed and everything. Teenagers are capable of understanding that there is a possibility, but they are not entirely capable of um, foreseeing that this is a, a, a real consequence of that action, right? Uh, they, they don't know... Uh, they don't know that they are not invincible yet. And this is not only because they, are, they haven't um, learned this in life, but also because their chemistry, as Jensen is saying, uh, in their brains is not completely capable of doing that. Yes, the Vagabanda phase is great. Very good. Thank you, Pauliana. That's it. Uh, it. It was a very emotional uh, season of my last song, you know. Uh, but what happens there is, um, and, and we... Uh, I could have gone with a more, uh, a little bit more refined example with the uh, uh, Feliz Ano Velho, you know, from uh, Marcelo Paiva, you know. But uh, the the bottom line is, uh, teenagers exactly. That's the movie, Julia. I walk to remember. Uh, teenagers are not capable of um, really considering what's going to happen. So this is one. Uh, uh, one thought, right? Jensen's basically saying that because this is not fully developed yet, we cannot expect teenagers to do that. So we, as parents or as teachers, we need to be kind of like external frontal lobes, and we have to tell them that, uh, no, look, point out to them that these are the consequences of what they are planning on doing. Uh, it's one of the reasons, for example, why talking about drugs with teenagers is very difficult, because uh, they, they, it's very um, it's complicated to think about the fact that drugs over time can lead to addiction and addiction can lead to, even though they are capable of uh, abstracting that, they are not capable of weighing the, the possibility of that happening. Uh, as Jensen puts that, uh, a guy, Lawrence Sternbar, is Steinberg, uh, he's saying that he's not really denying that because the frontal lobes are not fully developed. But what he, his point is that um, the problem for teenagers is that the rewards, they just look too good. So uh, when you think about, for example, uh, a beautiful afternoon like the one that is here that we have today in Sao Paulo, uh, by the by the in a park, for example, when you're 15 and you are, uh, there are a lot of things going on. But uh, that sunset is never going to be. Uh, the memory is not going to be uh, as appealing when you get older as when you were 15, for example. Uh, some might argue that this uh, is due to the fact that teenagers have less; uh, they don't have as much life experience. But um, the what Steinberg says is that the pleasure center in the brain, it's in the, uh, it's, its maximum size during the teenage years, and then it shrinks. So when you are, uh, when you're an adult, for example, uh, the rewards, they do not taste as good. So uh, doing things that give you pleasure, they are not going to be uh, as pleasurable when you are older than when you are a teenager. And he argues that because of that, uh, because it's not uh, as rewarding, and because when you're a teenager, the rewards are too appealing, then uh, teenagers, they can't, they can't really stop. Uh, so Jensen was talking about the frontal lobes and saying, okay, look, they cannot see the bad consequences of those actions. What Steinberg argues is uh, teenagers can see the consequences, they, they understand the consequences, but they can't care because the 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 positive side is just too good. So the thrill that they get from jumping into the water, like in the movie or in the, in the series, uh, that thrill is just, uh, they know that it's going to feel too good and it feels too good when they are doing it. So they cannot stop uh, from doing it, right? Uh, both, both of these uh, facts, uh, both of these biological uh, aspects, they are very important to understand what teenagers are going through and how they are different from adults. Uh, but they don't really tell the whole story. T 
teenagers, as somebody said uh, a little bit earlier, teenagers are difficult to deal with. Uh, it, it's a little bit old fashioned, but uh, we call in Portuguese, we call them aborrecentes, right? So uh, there's usually, um, there's usually a, a, a very heavy load uh, attached to, the, to, to being a teenager, right? Uh, so teenagers can be described, uh, and I got a quote that I like very much, uh, our youths love, now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority, disrespect for older people. Children nowadays are tyrants. They no longer rise when their elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, chatter before company, gobble their food, and tyrannize their teachers. I don't know if you have already uh, taught teenagers or if you uh, have a teenager at home, for example. Uh, but I think that as a, as a general definition goes, a lot of people would agree that this is a good definition for a teenager, right? Uh, they did not care about uh, the government. They did not care about what we have to say. Uh, that uh, that they gobble their food, so they eat. Uh, if you go to McDonald's here at Paulista Avenue, you might witness this firsthand, right? Uh, this was uh, this is a quote from Edward Hall from 1960. So. I'm not very good in uh, maths, but it's a 70 year old quote, right? Uh, it, it's tough, yes, absolutely. Uh, so 70, year, 70, years, uh, 70 years ago, we were uh, already describing teenagers that way. Actually, in this text, Hall is not really, uh, he's not saying that this is his opinion about teenagers. Uh, but he's uh, saying that this is what Socrates said. So we are talking about maybe 2,500 years ago, right? Uh, basically to say that people this age are difficult. 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, they are difficult and they have been difficult. Uh, oh, yes, absolutely. Six years, I told you I was not good at maths. 60 years, old, 60 years ago. Uh, so over half a century ago, right? Uh, this is a long time for people to be difficult. So uh, we talked about um, the biological aspect here, but really uh, what we are talking about is uh, a development that uh, has been happening for thousands of years. So humans as we are nowadays, uh, we are, our brains are pretty much the same. Of course, uh, recently technology has changed a lot in our, our chemistry as well, but we'll talk about that. But what a human really is hasn't really changed in, ever since we left uh, Africa 100,000 years ago, right? Uh, but adolescence as a phenomenon is really a product of the 20th century. So even though the biological things we have uh, have been talking to you about, they have been uh, happening in our brains for a long time. Uh, teenagers, as we understand them now, uh, they are really, um, they have been created uh, a little bit as a product, but a little bit as a consequence of three different aspects. Uh, so I, I think it's, I don't know if it's safe to say a revolution because it's not really uh, that revolutionary, but uh, having adolescence as something you recognize uh, as this kind of stage between being a kid and an adult is something uh, that's really uh, recent and that has really affected a lot uh, from uh, market, for example, economy uh, wise, but also in terms of culture, right? Uh, if you think about it, uh, when this quote was written in 1960, uh, only a few years uh, earlier, kids were working in factories, right? Uh, 12 year olds, 10 year olds. So they had to grow up a lot faster. And nowadays uh, we can talk about uh, adolescence as something that goes into your early twenties. So uh, what has, uh, really fueled this change, right? What has made uh, adolescence something that we can recognize as um, 
a real moment in people's lives and something that connects people from around the world. Uh, in this uh, globalized world, uh, you can see now when we are, we are teaching, we are in a very uh, unique moment because we are doing a lot of things, uh, well, basically everything we can online, right? Uh, and classes have been, uh, teachers are having to change a lot on how to deal with uh, groups with teenagers as well. Uh, but the interaction between teenagers has also been changing a lot. And we can see that uh, probably a 14-year-old in Brazil has more in common with a 14-year-old in the U.S. in terms of the things he or she does every day, in terms of entertainment, in terms of uh, even education, really, uh, than with a 40-year-old in the same neighborhood, right? Uh, uh, when I was teaching, uh, I had a group that uh, had only girls who were 13, 14 year old. Uh, and they talked about uh, YouTubers that I didn't even know existed, right? And all of them knew about those YouTubers and they talked to people from all over the world and they were into the same YouTubers, right? Uh, what has enabled uh, teenagers to form this kind of uh, global group, right? So um, I, I think that we can narrow it down to three main points uh, that happened in the post-war in the, in the U.S. and by extension in the world, because we are talking about uh, the Western civilization here. Uh, nowadays, this Western civilization has uh, culturally, it, it really has taken over the entire world, uh, not in every aspect, but uh, in terms of what being an adolescent really means, I think uh, I think it's something that might be uh, general in that sense, right? The factors that enable this, um, first of all, something that uh, we might not really uh, think about a lot, but uh, compulsory education is something that has really changed everything. If you went into a classroom a uh, hundred years ago, a hundred and twenty years ago, into a school, uh, for example, in the U.S. or uh, in Brazil, for example, uh, schools they didn't really have; uh, they weren't really located in huge buildings in which uh, all kids from one age group were in one room, and kids were a little bit older, a little bit younger, in a different one. Uh, what happened uh, a lot was uh, schools that had only one room and kids from, ver from varying uh, ages were studying together. So we're talking about multi-level nowadays. It's become a buzzword as well. But uh, really multi-level has, uh, it was the norm a lot longer than uh, leveling. Exactly. The, this, is, this, is, this picture is actually from the Austrian archive. Uh, so... Uh, I think that uh, it's funny because this this picture is maybe a hundred years old, uh, but uh, if you look at schools uh, around the world uh, or around Brazil nowadays, it won't look very different, right? Because this concept of a school, of what a classroom is supposed to be like, of how we organize students, uh, this concept will solidify in the beginning of the 20th century. And this, uh, generated uh, a change that uh, that had uh, a lot of re repercussions. Uh, because uh, when you started, and this goes with the fact that people started living in cities a lot more, we started having denser uh, agglomerations of people. Uh, but what happened was uh, those kids who were in the same classroom, in the same school, uh, they spent the entire day with people their age and they, uh, in, this was mandatory, uh, and they had to, to, to interact with people who were roughly the same age uh, on a daily basis. So we are talking about uh, schools in which, uh, for example, in the U.S., you have middle schools and high schools. Uh, in Brazil, we sometimes have uh, schools that are only from uh, grade one to grade nine, for example. Uh, some schools have high school uh, alongside it. But uh, because education was mandatory and because all of those kids, they needed to, uh, to interact with people who were the same age, 
they started uh, seeing the things that they had in common. They started uh, creating more things in common as well. Uh, and they started creating a division within society that was uh, really a new one. Uh, being divided by age is not as natural as we might consider. Um, and I, I think it's very clear when, when we see the difference between uh, the, the friends that we have when we are uh, in school and the friends we have when we are older. Uh, because when you're an adult, uh, your friends might be 10, 15 years older than you. Uh, it's very rare to have friends who are the exact same age as you, right? Uh, whereas when you're a teenager, basically all of your friends are going to be the same age. Uh, I remember a year in which I went to uh, maybe four uh, debutante parties, you know? Uh, sweet 16, well, sweet 15 in Brazil, right? Uh, so this division helped fostered their, um, uh, this unity between uh, people who were roughly the same age. Uh, so they, they had access, they could meet a lot more people. The second point here uh, that enabled that was the fact that uh, after the Second World War in the West, uh, we had uh, an economic boom, right? Uh, and that's when we started having welfare states in Europe, that's when we, uh, even in Brazil, we started having uh, economic uh, growth. And uh, in the US specifically, well, there was a moment there between 1945 and maybe uh, as late as 1970, for example, uh, in which uh, parents had fewer kids and they had more money to invest uh, on their kids, not only in their education, but also in their entertainment. That's crucial. Uh, the, the vital part here is uh, kids had more pocket money. They were able to spend money uh, on things that they were interested in. And there was a society building around these uh, kids that really wanted them to spend a lot of money. So uh, this kind of fed itself because uh, kids, uh, teenagers really, uh, they, uh, they were grouping and they were discovering tastes that they had in common and they started having money to spend on, uh, yes, uh, they, they were also able to work when they were uh, maybe 16 or 17, uh, maybe as early as 14. Uh, so these kind of jobs that they had, I, I think it's very clear when we compare to, to what teenagers nowadays have to face. Even if you wanted to work as a 14 or 15 year old in places where the law allows that, there are simply not enough jobs for adults to allow uh, teenagers to, to uh, enter the workplace that, that early, right? This is a problem that uh, is very relevant nowadays in Brazil as well, right? Um, so these kids uh, who are growing up after the Second World War, they had access to, to more things. And uh, because of the technological developments, uh, they, had, they were able to um, discover a lot more than the previous generations could. Uh, so that's why the, the baby boomers, the people who were born in the aftermath of the, the Second World War, they were uh, one of the defining generations in America. Uh, the third aspect, and this links to the other two, is, uh, I chose this one on purpose, but uh, is the technological development. So the things that we might not really uh, associate with technology nowadays, but that vehicle that you see there uh, is extremely high tech, right? Uh, it's, it's extremely complex and only an industrial uh, society is able to build these kind of things on large scale. Right, and have uh, all the infrastructure that is necessary to maintain these kind of vehicles, for example. So we have here uh, a gas station. So these kind of things uh, could only happen in a moment when there was access to the, the technology there, right? And also when money was uh, more abundant. So when we had the, the oil crisis in the 70s, for example, we started having a, a changing mindset there. But before that, cars were designed to be, uh, to use up a lot of fuel and uh, fuel economy was a concept that didn't make much sense until then, right? Uh, but there were two crucial inventions there 
where uh, both of these inventions are actually from before the wars, uh, the car and the telephone. But uh, after the Second War, uh, because technology became more affordable, teenager, teenagers were able to uh, make the most uh, out of them. So uh, I think that a great example is uh, Grease, the movie, because uh, you can clearly see that uh, the goal of the, their kid, those those teenagers they had the goal of getting a car and going to places, drive-ins and etc., uh, where they could. Uh, show off their cars and uh, do a lot of things. Uh, but what one of uh, what technology really brought to teenagers uh, is privacy. Before the, the, the Second War, if you wanted to have uh, a date, for example, uh, it would probably uh, happen in your living room with your entire family there. Uh, and, not really the most relaxed place to have a date, right? Uh, if you have your own car, you can drive the car to a place where nobody's around and uh, make out, really. Uh, with the telephone, you can have your own private line and have conversations. Uh, yes, absolutely. Greece is also the American dream, but uh, because they are still teenagers, not uh, in my understanding of the movie, not really all about the American dream because the American dream would be like work hard and build a house and you know uh, live a full life like that. I think it's more like an American dream in the, in the sense that uh, it's about freedom. And uh, when you see, for example, a James Dean movie or Easy Rider, for example, uh, this is a, a concept that is very much associated to America but uh, it's also very strongly connected to adolescence, right? Uh, this is the moment in which we, uh, as a society, allow our, uh, those teenagers to dare a little bit more, right? Uh, I used to have long hair when I was a teenager, you know? Uh, people might, uh, would have mocked me, but uh, it was the only moment in which I was able to actually do that, right? Uh, so it's it's a very much associated to this freedom there, right? Um, but what I was saying about technology is it enabled uh, teenagers to really um, to take the the control of the situation, right? So if they were if they had their own vehicles, if they uh, were able to set their own uh, schedules, for example, uh, they were uh, they could leave home, for example. They could do anything, right? Yes, that's why I think this is a revolution in a sense, because uh, when we look back and the, we romanticize this period a lot, uh, it's like when we think about the 60s and we picture everybody as hippies. But uh, when you look at the 50s, for example, we, yeah, we picture a lot of uh, James Dean, for example, um, those uh, motorcycles that uh, were very noisy, but weren't really that fast, right? Uh, and this was uh, this could only have happened in this moment in time because these three factors, the this change in education, uh, this economic uh, boom, uh, and the technological revolution, they happen at the same time. And so they uh, really created a, a different kind of, uh, of being there. Right, uh, and these uh, adolescents, they they have really, uh, I would say, they have uh, kind of like set the standard for uh, an, an, uh, a behavior that we try to emulate, right? Um, and I think it's very much noticeable when we see that uh, nostalgia is something very, very. Um, very clear nowadays, right? So we 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 look back in, into the past a lot, uh, and we had a moment in the eighties when we were thinking about the fifties, and in the nineties when we were dreaming about the sixties. And now it seems like we are trying to go back to the nineties. Uh, and the, the the reason there is uh, when we have these these people who are in in charge of entertainment, really. We are trying to to go back to our teenage years in a way, right? Uh, so nowadays, uh, when you look at media, you see like uh, the kind of things that we were enjoying when we were, uh, well, maybe twenty years ago, for example, right? Uh, 
so to sum up what we're what I was saying here, uh, I think it's very important that we think about the 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 changes that are that are happening in teenagers' brains. So the the neurological paths there are very important to understand all those changes that they're going through. Uh, but we also have uh, uh, a social category that they can belong to. And being a teenager uh, is also, even though it's a very difficult moment and changes are all about that, uh, we have a society starting to embrace this a little bit more and to envy teenagers a little bit as well, right? But uh, if, uh, as I was uh, discussing here, if these three things, the compulsory education, this kind of model in which we are all in the same classroom, uh, the economic boom in which uh, we have more money to go around and we allow teenagers to earn their own money, but also spend their parents' money, in the technological revolutions, if those three things are what uh, made these uh, teenagers what they are, then the, the question that is very very much in, in vogue now is, what is it going to be like in the near future? Uh, the generation that is now be, uh, entering adulthood, uh, early 30s, for example, is a generation that um, spent their teenage years in the post 9-11 world. So we are already talking about um, a generation that saw firsthand uh, maybe the biggest economic crisis in almost a century in the 2007-2008 uh, bubble burst. Uh, now we are dealing with the pandemic, right? Uh, so this is already disrupting the economic aspect uh, that we were discussing. When you think about technologies, uh, I think it's scary to think that uh, the first iPhone is now a teenager, right? It's 13, uh, it was uh, released in 2007. So we are not even two decades into the smartphone revolution. And we can already uh, see the effects that this has uh, on us and on teenagers as well. And I, I think that these kids who are uh, growing up now, they will face this a lot more. I see my son uh, trying to unlock smartphones, for example. I'm pretty sure that if, he had more access to smartphones, he would be able to uh, use them a little bit proficiently. And he's one and a half, you know? Uh, so these technological changes are really going to affect how uh, we are going to define teenagers maybe 10 years from now. Uh, and in terms of compulsory education, I think this uh, pandemic is something that uh, has really showed us how we cannot keep up the same model as we saw in the Austrian picture from a century ago. Uh, this is just not working anymore. Uh, and I'm not only talking about the fact that, that we are having to have our classes online, for example. Uh, kids who are in class, they, chances are that they are not really there most of the time. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, when uh, the, the smartphone boom was still in the beginning. We were trying to uh, limit how much students could use their phones in class. Nowadays, the, the trend that most schools have, uh, they seem to be uh, following is, we are not really trying to take the phone away from classroom, from our classes, uh, but we are actually trying to use them as well as we can. And in, schools and for teachers who were already trying to address technology a little bit more, uh, this moment that we are going through, uh, had it has, of course, a lot of challenges. But I, I think that uh, people who are already trying to do something in that sense, they are probably dealing with the, the, the media aspect of this change a little bit better. And I don't think there's going back there. So what, uh, how, in terms of what we have been discussing for the past half hour, how is this going to change how we think about adolescents? How is this going to affect, really, how, uh, how young they are when they become teenagers and how old they are when they stop being teenagers, right? When are we going to draw this line? Uh, and the, the thing is, 
uh, culture is going to be the most probably, well, in my opinion, really, uh, culture is going to be the most relevant, uh, the the most relevant force there. Because we have this idea of a teenager that was built over the, the last half century of uh, how teenagers are supposed to be, uh, I think that uh, those changes are not really going to affect how teenagers behave in the near future. But it might change uh, further down the road. Uh, I don't know if you are uh, familiar with this, but uh, I was reading a study that said that uh, it, it was discussing how uh, red-haired girls are usually, uh, you know, they, they have usually uh, not bad behavior, but they are usually more explosive and stuff like that. Uh, and it was kind of like a Tostini's dilemma, you know? Uh, were they uh, were they fiercer, uh, more fierce, because uh, this was, you know, part of who they were? Uh, or was it because we expected them to be like that, so they, they, they became a little bit uh, more strong-willed, you know? So uh, are teenagers, pers- uh, you know, difficult to deal with because uh, that's part of who they are? Or is it because we expect them to be difficult, so they have a little bit more leeway in that sense? Uh, I think that in if we are if we anticipate that they are going to be difficult, chances are they are going to be more difficult. But uh, so we really need to to kind of like uh, give them a chance to be themselves before we before we really uh, pigeonhole, them, right? Uh, Yes, I think that online classes are something that's going to be a, a real challenge. Uh, I, for one, am not a good student uh, in online classes, uh, but I think that um, the fact that we are we're having to teach students how to learn this way, and we have to learn uh, a little bit how to do that too. But uh, if, as I was uh, suggesting, if the the social aspect of being a teenager and interacting with other teenagers the most of the time, if this is one of the things that defines what being an adolescent really is, then uh, the fact that we are not allowing them to have enough free time with their friends, for example, is something that is going to impact them negatively. So uh, as much as this is, well, I don't know how feasible this might be, but uh, maybe we should be working more towards having, uh, you know, kind of like uh, having break a lot more than having classes, right? Uh, well, this is what I wanted to tell you a little bit uh, more about the invention of adolescence. Um, I would like to know if you, uh, well, the questions that you have, I, I was trying to address the ones that you that you posed as I was talking. Um, yeah, okay, Marcel is saying here about uh, uh, getting students' attention, right? Uh, and yes, this is also, this is something that is difficult in face-to-face classes and it's harder online uh, because, you know, the internet is just one tab away. So, and students, well, teenagers actually, uh, we were talking about self-awareness uh, a little bit earlier. The, uh, adolescents think that they are more capable of multitasking than they actually are. So uh, they they think that they can keep up with uh, what we are trying, what we are doing in classes, and you know what they are doing in the other tab. And we know that this is not true, right? But they don't know yet. So um, getting their attention is definitely one of the challenges. I think that sustaining that attention for uh, for a little bit longer is actually the hardest part, right? Um, we can get their attention for a moment, but how do we keep that going for maybe 20, 30 minutes, right? And we have to take into account that online, we cannot expect them to be uh, listening to us uh, as attentively as they would face-to-face, right? Okay, and it's asking here if adolescent can go up to 24. Yeah, well, uh, I think it will depend a lot on uh, how you are, what exactly you are, um, what exactly we're aiming at defining here. 
Because if you're talking about the biological processes, uh, then yes, it's possible that by when they are 24, uh, they are still the, the frontal lobes are still not completely insulated. Um, socially, however, I would say that uh, by the time uh, people are 24, yeah, I, I, I would say that they are not teenagers anymore in that sense uh, of what we are discussing here. However, I think it's it's a very good question because in terms of mental maturity, right? Uh, I think that we cannot really expect 24 year olds to, to have fully uh, reached uh, the adulthood ideal that we have there. So yeah, I would say that's fair. Uh, let's see, Carly saying that. Yes, absolutely. Katrin Selene, yes. Uh, I think that the, the, this goes a lot into what we're talking about education, right? Uh, if we're thinking about education as providing information, then yes, absolutely. Uh, a video is, uh, this, this is actually something that surprises me a lot because teenagers have, I, I don't know about you, uh, how comfortable you are watching, uh, you know, like YouTube videos and stuff like that. But uh, I think that, well, for me at least, I get information a lot faster and a lot more uh, uh, effectively by reading than by watching a video. And this might be just me, but I think that information is a lot denser when we are uh, reading than when we are watching a video. Teenagers, they love watching videos and they, they would spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, we need to, as educators, I think we need to learn how to tap that, how to, what is it that makes, um, okay, an outdated reference here, outdated by maybe two years, but uh, what makes Logan Paul so uh, interesting for teenagers, for example? Uh, maybe in, uh, instead of watching uh, educators talk about education, we should be watching YouTubers presenting, right, to see what we can get from that. Um, of course, uh, I, I think we shouldn't uh, uh, get too much into the edutainment kind of thing, but uh, maybe they're doing something, right? Uh, let's see, Viviani asked, they think they can use tech better than adults, but cannot read a through line instruction. Yes. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is an issue, right? Uh, maybe we are, uh, Maybe we're losing this a little bit, right? Being able to follow instructions that are written. Uh, as you see, because of the technological changes, uh, reading has become a lot harder to, to come by. Uh, we thought that, I, I don't know if you remember this whole debate, but um, I remember maybe 12 or 15, maybe, years ago, when we were talking about uh, how cell phones would actually foster reading skills and stuff like that, we didn't account for WhatsApp uh, audios, right? Um, to understand your tweets, the react to challenges. Yeah, yes, Nicasio. I think that uh, challenging is something that can work here. A uh, group of six teenagers. What I find most difficult. Oh yes, absolutely. This is this is a key. Wait, who was it who said that? Poliana. Yeah, I think that uh, Poliana uh, raised a good point here. Online, we can't really see. Uh, we can't really use the uh, or adult expertise, right? Uh, this is it goes a little a little bit beyond uh, our scope here, but uh, I think it's still relevant uh, because uh, how uh, the fact that we are more experienced, uh, that we have been uh, we have been dealing with teenagers longer probably than teenagers have been dealing with adults, uh, and they think that they can hide very well the things that they are thinking. Uh, but uh, through uh, body language, sometimes the, the things that are between the words there, uh, you can get a lot from them. And yes, online, this is a lot harder to do, right? Um, okay, Lucien asked a good question about how dealing with uh, students who, have, uh, who are hyperactive or autistic in online classes. Um, I, I am not really, uh, I don't think I'm, I'm qualified enough to 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 help you there. Uh, although um, I think that we are going to have to 
rearrange your model here, right? And this is only my opinion, but uh, when you're thinking about teenagers, uh, this whole online aspect is maybe easier than it is for kids, right? Uh, so we'll see how this goes. Yeah? Yes, we do have to be open to learning there. Absolutely. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, our time is almost up. Uh, I want to to thank you for uh, you know your patience there. Uh, I know that there are a lot of things when we scheduled this uh, webinar a long time ago. Uh, we couldn't have foreseen that uh, we would be well doing everything online, right? Uh, so I, I appreciate the fact that even though you, you're probably spending a lot more time in front of your computers, you still, uh, well, still felt like watching me. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, here you have, uh, Tarka's Instagram. So if you do not follow us, uh, please do. Uh, if you want to, to drop me a line, I will send my email here. But it's uh, at uh So if there's anything you would like to discuss, if you want to, I didn't uh, include the, the references I uh, used here because I talked about the names of the, the researchers. Thank you, Lari. Uh, but if you want to read a little bit more about this social revolution, about adolescence, uh, then just... Uh, Get in touch, and I will send you. I will send you the references. Okay. All right. Yes. Traka rules. Good. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you have uh, well a great month of May. Right. Thanks a lot.